very funny in the ears of a man who is used to falsehood. The truth will taste very funny in the ears of a man who is used to lies. So I, and that's where the issue is. The issue is that so many have been taught wrongly. So many have been taught what they think is the truth, but it's actually men's innovations, men's thoughts read into the scriptures. So now when we look at the scriptures itself, it looks like what we're saying is controversial. That's okay. where the issue is. Now, you preach that once saved, we are saved uh, forever? Well, that's a cliche they use, but I didn't okay. say that. What okay. I said is once you are saved, you have eternal life. Okay. You have everlasting life. Because mm -hmm. that's what the Bible says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting right. life. Yeah. So they use the cliche of once saved, forever saved, to explain what I just explained from the scriptures. Yes, but uh, let us stay with what, what they are saying. How does salvation operate? Do we get saved and then we get unsaved and then we are saved again? Well, <laughs> the Bible tells us in the book of John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29, mm -hmm. I give you eternal life and you shall never perish and none shall be able to pluck you out of my hands. My father that gave you to me is greater than all, and no one shall be able to pluck you out of my father's hands. Jesus said, all that the father is giving to me, none is lost, except the son of perdition, which was Judas Iscariot, because Judas Iscariot never got saved. He never believed the Bible. The Bible also tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then he now says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. So salvation is of God. You see, salvation is what Christ has done. In the book of Jonah, Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord. So salvation is the work of Christ. It's not the work of a man, not of works. It is what Christ has done. So Jesus is the sota of salvation, which also means he's the guarantor and the guarantee of salvation. Okay, Jesus is the guarantee of... Uh, now, you, you also are said to have said that uh, until we fix the misinterpretation of God, uh, we are not sure of the next generation. Yes. You are very concerned about the yes. interpretation we make of God, yes. which um, is very faulty, the grounds on which we, we are working on, according to you, is yes. very faulty. Yes. And once it is not fixed, the generation of tomorrow is, um, is not guaranteed, yes. especially the church. Yeah. Yes. What do you mean by this? The reason is because, you see, when the Bible is misinterpreted, mm -hmm. a truth, a major truth is lost. Secondly, the Bible can never mean today what it never meant when it was first written. Thirdly, it therefore follows that until the scriptures are properly interpreted, until your knowledge of God is situated within the rightly divided word of truth, you can never be able to understand the character of God. God wants man to know him because God wants to relate. God is a family man. He wants to relate. But you can't relate with someone whose character you don't understand. You can't relate with someone whose character you cannot trust. You can't relate with someone whose, whose personality you don't know. In years passed by, in the church world, there's been a lot of misrepresentation of God's character. So sometimes you don't even know. Is God love or does God kill? Does God give life or does God take away life? Is God good or is God bad? Is God a loving father or is God just an area father? Do you need to bribe God before God blesses you? Because in so many churches, they tell you if you don't give to God, you cannot get. So God looks like a celebrated contractor who requires mobilization to do something for you. So it's like the relationship men have with God is a transactionary relationship. So because of all of this lack of sound interpretation of God's character, many people, I can tell you, don't go to churches. Many have stayed away from church because they can't even relate to this God. Many young people are going into atheism 
Because they can't relate with a God who says he's a God of love, and yet he allows disease, sickness, he allows things to parade the society. And the reason all of these narratives are passed across is because there has not been a clear interpretation of the holy writ called the Holy Bible. Okay. Because you can never know God's character outside of the revelation of himself. In fact, the truth is, you can't find God. You cannot find God. Any attempt to find God will land you in trouble because God cannot be found. God can only reveal himself to you because you can't find him. So, since man cannot find God, God became a man in the person of Jesus. He became a man to walk amongst men so that men can know God in the person of Christ. So, until you accept that Jesus is God Almighty, then you can never know God because whatever you see Jesus do is what God does. Whatever Jesus does not do, God never does. In the book of John, he says, the disciples say to Jesus, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said, Philip, have I been this long time with you, and yet you don't know the Father? Okay. He that has seen me has seen the Father. So okay. Jesus is the Father revealed. Jesus is the Father manifest. Jesus said, what I see my Father do, I do. Meaning, Jesus reveals to us what God's capacity, God's ability, and what God is capable of doing, and what God does not do. So Jesus is the exact revelation of the character, the attitude, and the person of God Almighty. Now, until that is explained and well taught and emphasized, mm -hmm. the next generation has no reason to be attracted to a God that is almost bipolar. He's one time happy, one time he's sad, one time he wakes up angry and destroys with thunder, brimstone, and earthquakes. Another time he says, I'm a savior, I died for you. They can't relate with that kind of... Dr. Eben, uh, all of what you are saying, inferences are taken from the Bible that God did this in the Old Testament. God was happy with the Israelites and then at once he gets uh, angry. All of these things are in the Bible and illustrations are taken from the Bible for anything that is being preached to the people. In fact, let me be clear with you, Mr. Leonard. Yeah. All divergent religions in the world came from the Bible. Okay. And the reason is because it depends on what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Native doctors use the Bible. Islam <laughs> got their Quran from the Bible, mm. the five books of Moses. Mm. All religions. The issue is what are they looking for? So when Jesus showed up, this is what Jesus said in John 5, 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. He said, but they are they which testify of me. In Luke chapter 25, verse 20, 24, verse 25, when Jesus rose from the dead, on the way to Emmaus, he met two disciples of his, arguably Cleopas and his wife. They were discussing about the event of the past three days. And they were discussing about the fact that they thought Jesus was coming to restore political power, restore political relevance. And they said, and to make matters worse, today is the third day. Some women went to the tomb and they said they didn't find the body. Then Jesus turned to them and he said to them, O oh fools, in verse 25, slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets, Old Testament prophets, major and minor prophets, have spoken. Then he went further. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27. And beginning at Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Moses, and all the prophets, major, minor prophets, intensive Bible study, he expounded. Now that word expounded is the first time that word is used in the New Testament. It is a Greek word, daimonia. It means he interpreted, which means Jesus interpreted Moses. He interpreted the prophets, major and minor prophets. And at the end of his interpretation, he arrived at the things concerning himself. It is not the things concerning himself that are alone in the Bible. There are marriages, there are wars, there are deaths. There are disasters, but Jesus didn't expound that. Okay. He expounded the things concerning himself. So we say that the Bible is a Christocentric book that carries with it a Christocentric message. So if you're not looking for Christ in your study of scripture, then you will arrive at all the other things that created the room for divergent religions all over the world. Okay. Um, many persons are watching and uh, sending uh, questions. I hope you're going to take uh, some of the questions. Just send them through uh, the numbers on the, the screen. But this one says, Hello, uh, good evening. I'm so delighted to see you and my favorite pastor from Nigeria. Big up to Prime uh, Mr. Liu. Please, 
ask our Dr. Abel uh, to teach on tithes and offerings to these our men of we our men and women of God to get a better understanding about our giving. Uh, thanks. I'm Pascal, writing from Boya. Wow, Pascal, thank you for reaching out. Well, you want me to answer that? Yes. Well, fight and tithing, you know, uh, it's such a big issue in the scriptures. Mm. Uh, you know, and I have a 15, uh, about 15 part series on fight and tithing because it's such a huge subject that requires careful examination so that we arrive at the truth of scripture concerning tithe and tithing. But you can find them on YouTube. They also the messages are all there. You can go Google them out and check them out. But just for the purpose of a little teaser, a little teaser. There, we are, don't so, there, are, so, there are so many persons who are watching in rural settings who may not have access. Access, to... yes. So that's why I want to give a teaser, yeah. just for the purpose of a teaser. But we don't do Bible teachings with teasers. But just to help, tithe originated, originated historically from the worship of idols, from idol worship. That's the history of tithing. And if you remember, the first person who paid tithe in the Bible was Abraham, who was an idol worshipper. He was a worshipper of the moon and the sun. Historically, in the days of Abraham, when you go to war and you fight war and you come back and you win the war, you bring 10% of the profit of the war and you give it to a deity. You pay it to an idol, a deity for helping you to win the war. Now, Abraham meets God get saved in chapter 12 of genesis get thee out of your father's house to a land i will show you and i will bless you abraham now in chapter 14 they stole lot and when they took lot abraham took train servants from his house to go and rescue lot after rescuing lot when he came back he met melchizedek who was a type a typology of jesus Melchizedek saw Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High, the possessor of the heavens and the earth. And blessed be the Most High who has given you victory over your enemies. When Abraham had the blessings, because of his background, he took 10% and gave to Melchizedek. He was not de it was not demanded. That was Abraham's level of generosity. From his background where he's coming from god didn't demand for it that's why he said and abraham gave not pay he gave tithes of all now god wanted israel to become a kingdom of priests in exodus chapter 19 and israel said to god no we don't want to talk to you talk to moses they appointed moses their mediator Talk to Moses. When Moses talks to us, whatever we want to talk to you, we'll tell Moses to tell you. God doesn't force people. So God allowed for Moses to be the go-between. And then God now gave Moses rules and regulations for Israel. But God said to Moses, they will not keep it. They will break it. And I don't want to destroy them. Set up for them a Levitical priesthood. Now, that Levitical priesthood will be, you know, they will work with Moses to serve Israel on behalf of God. So because the Levites was a tribe in Israel that was separated to serve in the temple. They will not have time to go to work. Moses took from Abraham's experience the tithe and brought it in as a payment so that the Levites, the widows, and the strangers can be taken care of. So the tithe now became a law. Abraham, it was given. Under the law of Moses, because the people demanded, Moses made it a law throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, if you pay attention, throughout the ministry of Jesus, nobody paid tithe. Nobody received tithe. Nobody gave tithe. The apostles never paid tithe. Throughout the book of Acts, nobody paid, nobody received. The reason is because Christ is the end of the law of Moses for righteousness to those who believe. Romans chapter 10 verse 4. Christ is the end of it. So Jesus put an end to the law of tithing. But in the book of Acts, as the New Testament church begins, we see people selling properties. We see people selling things and bringing. So the New Testament is giving out of generosity, not out of percentage. People gave. People sold their properties and gave. The reason is because in the New Testament, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, so we give motivated by love, not keeping of percentage. Now, that's just the little I can say concerning tithe, but there's a whole exhaustive study 
where we read scripture to scripture and explain them within the context of the written word. Yeah, but he also talked about giving, eh? The yes, the giving is New Testament. Okay. We give generously, we give sacrificially, we give and give and give until the need is met because God loves a cheerful giver. New Testament giving comes from love, it comes from an appreciation of God's goodness, it comes from being responsible for the advancement of the gospel all over the earth by your giving to make things happen like television, radio, crusades, outreaches so that the gospel of your father reaches the ends of the earth. That's being responsible and generous. That's New Testament. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Liu. I'm writing from uh, Bermuda. Thank God for his servant who is in the house with you. We are blessed uh, this night. Please ask him about the cases where we go for crusades. People are called to come out and give money and uh, so that they can be blessed uh, let him also talk about uh, this issue of uh, seats well Thank you. Uh, you know one of the problems we have um, and, and it's such a big problem okay. is a misrepresentation of god's character are the full teaching on the misunderstood god i think that's about 40 50 hours the misrepresentation of god's character god has been projected by the materialistic gospel there's a gospel called the materialistic gospel. It's a gospel that emphasizes material gain. It's a gospel that weighs your spirituality by how successful you are monetarily, in business, in career on the earth. And they believe that the blessing of God is when you give that you get blessed. So there's that gospel where you're asked to tap the anointing, where you're asked to, your, your sacrifice determines how much God blesses you. The problem with that gospel is this. If God has to wait for you to give before he blesses you, then God is reactionary. For God to react means he's not God. Because God doesn't need to react. Because he knows the beginning from the end, and he knows the end from the beginning. So he doesn't need to react. So that is why the Bible tells us that God has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. He's not waiting for you to give for him to bless you. He died before you knew you needed a savior. He gave you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He gave you everything that is in Christ Jesus. So that transactionary gospel is a mutilation of God's character. It makes God look petty. That God will not bless you until you give him something. That God will not heal you of sickness until you give him something. Let me give you an experience somebody shared with me. Okay. He came in from America and, uh, and, and he shared, I think America or Canada, somebody was sharing with me, I can't put, put my finger on it, about somebody who went to a crusade where a particular prophet promised to heal the sick. And when they arrived, he demanded for one 1,000 US dollars. You cannot see him, he will not pray for you until you give him a 1,000 US dollars. And this person they brought was critically sick. And the person was saying, so you mean if I don't have money, God cannot even do anything for me because I really don't have money. And that's how the, the person sent them away. Then the person stumbled on my teachings and began to listen to my teachings and faith came alive. And the person got healed without paying a dime. Because that's the true character of God. The Bible says, freely you have received. You freely give. The blessings of God are free. Anything that comes from Christ that you must buy is falsehood. Everything that Christ gave is free. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 32, He that spared not his son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Everything that comes from Jesus is freely given. So why do we give money? We give money, number one, in response to the love of God. Number two, we give because we want to be responsible for our Father's work on earth. We are not giving to massage God to do something for us. That transactionary gospel is very dubious. I mean, imagine your earthly father, your own biological father. That for your father to give you audience, you have to give him small money. For your father to talk to you, you have to give him small money. What kind of wicked father is that? And Jesus said, if you that are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your father? The father I serve, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't need a dime from you to do anything for you. He blesses you. He makes his sun to shine on the good and on the bad. He makes his rain to fall on the good and on the evil. That's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everything he gives is freely given. Everything he gives is uh, free. Uh, we'll quote you. You see, I was a champion. 
uh, when it comes to prosperity preaching. Those of you who can still remember can testify to that. I was swimming on materialism uh, preaching and it worked well for me. I wrote so many books on how to become rich. Such books are misleading. So if you still have any of those books, I advise you burn it uh, because they don't take you to Christ. You said this? Yes. Yes, um, I said it to our church. Yes. What what came? What happened? The truth is, I got tired. I was preaching this material. I was all over the place. The, it, people know me in Cameroon back then. I mean, okay. I'm talking about many years ago. Okay. I was all over the world. I mean, I preached for the best pulpit. Mm -hmm. Best. I preached for people like Benny Hinn. I mean, all over the world. I was everywhere. And I could raise this money. But I got to a point where I was empty. I was frustrated. And I felt lost. As a preacher of the gospel. So I went to God in prayer and I thought maybe my ministry has finished. Maybe it was time for me to die. So I went to God in prayer and I said, God, I don't understand this emptiness. I'm no more happy. I'm no more excited. I have lost total sense of purpose. I'm no more fulfilled. I'm no more excited. So I left my church and I started praying. I went to America to spend some time with my children who are in school. And I decided to use one moon to fast and pray and just see God. After praying, nothing came. I went to the bookshop to buy books as my culture usually is. I like reading. And then I saw Andrew Womack. I used to see him on TV. He looks to me like a very uninteresting preacher, like a boring person. But I see people listening to him all over the world. So I felt like he must be saying something. Let me find out what he's saying. But I can't watch him on TV. Let me buy his books. So I bought all his books. But I didn't read. I came back to Nigeria still feeling empty and void. So I told my wife, let's go on another retreat. I didn't go to my church. I traveled again. Now when we traveled throughout the period of prayer, I didn't read the books. On our way back, as I got in the aircraft, I took Andrew Womack's book, one of his books. The first eight pages settled my life. I now knew what was missing in my life. I went home and I took out time to now study. And I began to study the scriptures. And then I discovered, okay, the materialistic gospel is actually not the gospel. Okay. The gospel of Christ has nothing to do with materialism. That's why in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, Brother Paul would write to the church in Galatia and call them foolish Galatians. Why did he call them foolish? He said, he said to them, he says, you have not lasted in the gospel. You are so soon removed from him who has called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. Then he added, for there are some that trouble you. So any gospel that is not Christ, materialism, it's a trouble. A trouble. It means it is supposed to rob you of your realities in Christ. Giving you a false narrative that keeps you ever hoping and never arriving. He calls it another gospel, which is not another. So I spent time studying. And I saw that the message of the scriptures is salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I saw that the message of the scriptures are eternal realities. Things that are, Brother Peter will put it like this. He said, you are called into an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away, reserved for you in heaven. When those realities hit me and I took time to study exhaustively, I came back to my church. I apologized for this materialistic gospel that was handed down. You know, we just learned from other preachers. I didn't do my own research. I didn't study. I didn't pray. I just took what every preacher was preaching that sounded popular and okay, and I mastered it, and I kept running with it. But now I'm having a personal encounter with God's word, and I'm beginning to see what was wrong. I came to my church and made up my mind I was ready to lose that whole church of thousands and begin afresh teaching the truth. So I apologized. I begged them. I explained to them. And I said, look, if you want to leave this church, you are free to leave. You're free because I know you may feel disappointed. You may feel hot that I misled you with what I preach. But that's what I knew. That's what I was taught. But now on a very serious note, I did my own research. And I will show you from scripture to scripture. So we began. A lot of people left our church. A lot they left. Because those people came for miracles. They came for things. They didn't come for Christ. I began to teach Christ. I began to teach Christ. The people that were with me understood. And gradually more people began to come. And today our ministry is bigger than what it has ever been. Because people are seeking for Jesus. The Bible says all men seek thee. The Bible says Jesus, the desire of all nations. So today we have people coming in and they are learning Christ. Their hope is restored. Let me be honest with you. Many people in our church are people that stayed away from church 20 years, 15 years. They had no reason to go to church. They were fed up. Now they have seen a ray of hope, a ray of light all over the world. They are now coming back to study Christ.
to know Christ and grow in the knowledge of Christ. When you say when you say um, prosperity gospel, if I may term it that way, is misleading. Who is misleading our people and to where? Well, and the, is Christ not preached in in uh, the mix of this prosperity uh, gospel? Well, once it becomes a mixture, that's why it is deception. Okay. Because you can't have deception without an element of truth. Deception is a mixture of lies and truth. Mm -hmm. That's why Brother Paul will say to Timothy, he says, and that from it, he says to him, as a newborn babe, desire the sincere. That word sincere is pure, mm -hmm. not mixed. Mm -hmm. Because there can be no growth, there can be no truth in a lie. It has to be pure truth or it is not truth at all. The gospel of Christ must be preached in its entirety, in its completeness, without additions. Additions corrupt a little living, leaving it the whole lump. Mm -hmm. That's why it has to be either pure or it is not gospel at all. Okay. Um, I will use some of your quotes here. Uh, you say that uh, uh, any, any born-again believer going about looking for deliverance don't have a spiritual problem but an english problem yes because the word deliverance is a movement from one kingdom to another the day you got born again was the day you were delivered <laughs> colossians chapter 1 verse 12 giving thanks unto the father who has made us meet the word qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light watch this who has delivered delivered past us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So that word deliverance is a movement from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, which is what happened to you the day you got born again. Is the Greek word aphesis. Aphesis is the Hebrew word peleta. In the book of Obadiah, chapter 1, verse 70, where the word deliverance was gotten from, it says, Upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. And the sons of Jacob shall possess their possession. That word deliverance in, in that Obadiah is the word peleta. Peleta means upon Mount Zion shall be the assemblage of the delivered ones. Deliverance doesn't happen in Zion. Deliverance happens outside Zion. But once you are delivered by salvation, the delivered ones are gathered in Zion. So deliverance is a movement from one kingdom to another. But it is different from casting out devils. Okay. Casting out devils is not deliverance. Deliverance is not casting out devils. Casting out devils means to expel unclean spirit. And it is done in people who don't have Christ. It is done in unbelievers. That's why Jesus said, when an unclean spirit is cast out, it goes about dry places, seeking for accommodation. If it doesn't find, it will say, let me go back to my house. The reason why it calls it my house is because the man was not born again from where I was driven. And when it comes and the house is clean and Christ is not in, the unclean spirit will go and bring seven more wicked demons and they will come and occupy and the state of the person is worse. But if Christ entered the heart of that person, the unclean spirits cannot come back again because light and darkness cannot cohabit. When the entrance of God's word comes in, light shines, darkness exits. So deliverance is a movement from one kingdom to another and it is done at salvation but casting out demons is done by christians who are saved in unbelievers that's why i say these signs shall follow those that believe in my name believers shall cast out devils it didn't say believers shall have devils cast out of them uh -uh. it is the believers that will cast out devils so any child of god that is born again that is going around looking for deliverance either has an english problem or an ignorant ignorance problem of what happened to the person because do you know what it means to be born again it means all of god in christ came inside to take up residence where god lives satan and demons can't stay there they are not classmates and they are not age mates yeah but um i'm perplexed myself because you have persons who go for deliverance almost every uh, and if you time. observe, yeah. the same people are delivered all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's either the people doing, going all the time to be delivered are stupid, <laughs> or the people delivering them are stupid. Because if you really have power, and you deliver pe one person one time, he should be free forever. But why are they always having the demon problem? Because their problem is not deliverance. There's a problem that the deliverance minister is not dealing with. And that's knowledge. My people are destroyed, not for too many devils, but for a lack of knowledge. 
-hmm. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Um, how about the situation where we have generational curses that is working against uh, a family? A child of God cannot have generational curses. Okay. It's not possible. Now, where did, generational, where did that teaching come from? It started from a misinterpretation of the scripture. Okay. In Exodus, where the Bible says, I will visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth okay. generation. That word visit, that word visit there, is not English language, it's Bible language. It's the Hebrew word pakwad, P-A-Q-A-D, pakwad. It means I will take care of. I will take care of. That is, the iniquities of the fathers, I will take care of it so that it does not affect the children to the third and fourth generation. Hmm. Did you get that? That's why when he now uses the word visit, hmm? are you following? <laughs> when he now uses the word visit <laughs> in the book of Exodus, hmm. he now, in the book of Genesis, he's using the same word visit. He says, and the Lord visited Sarah as he has said, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had spoken. And what was the outcome? And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. So the word visit means to take care of. It means the Lord took care of Sarah. So the word visit is that the Lord will take care of. And if you observe, that generation that we are told that they will visit to the third and fourth generation, that immediate generation where the, the people in the wilderness, their children didn't die. That means the idol worship of the parents didn't affect the children because God took care of. So what we have in Africa is people are taking advantage of people's ignorance. There's nothing like generational cause for a child of God. If any man in Christ is a new creation, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. You know, the problem with Africa is poverty. And the poverty is not from God. It's from the way we manage our societies. So because there's a lot of poverty, so when they tie these wrong teachings to your experiences, it makes sense. But it's not Bible sense. It's carnal sense. But once you begin to look at the Bible for yourself and you begin to see the freedom that is in Christ Jesus, the book of Galatians says, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I'm telling you, there's nothing like generational causes for a child of God, nothing like ancestral causes or family patterns. All those teachings rob you of your blessings in Christ. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Liu. Please, I want to ask uh, Dr. Abel, is it right to sell anointing water and uh, anointing uh, materials that some men of God and prophets are selling today for healing and deliverance? I'm Ernest, uh, writing from uh, Limbe. Uh, good evening, Mr. Liu. Please ask uh, the man of God where his church is in uh, Cameroon so that we can go there. Um, I don't know if persons want to come to your church. You we have a conference. In fact, I'm preaching tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening here in Douala. Okay. And the venue is uh, help me, help me, help Revelation me. Church. Jesus Revelation Church, New Revelation Church, New Revelation church. in Bonaberry. In Bonaberry, hmm. New Revelation Church in Bonaberry Bena by 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 10 a.m. tomorrow and 4 p.m. tomorrow evening. But I'm sure they will give you the address so you read it properly for the people and maybe a phone number that you can call for direction okay. in case you're having any issues. But I'm here tomorrow, the whole of tomorrow. It's going to be a brutal day because we're going to open up a lot of things and we're going to minister to people and I want to encourage every one of you in Douala, even those outside Douala, if you can drive down, beat me here in Douala tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening. It's going to be life-changing. Yes. Now I'm the question... Yes. The, selling of articles. Yeah, I, 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 want, I wanted, he is this, uh, sending this message just when I wanted to quote you also, where you, you say that no oil, water, apron, or any other objects can be holy or anointed. You say don't be deceived, all these things are shadows. Yes, that's right. That's right. Because, okay, your oil, olive oil has manufactured an expiry date. So God expires, right? The anointing expires. Just think about it. Those things are all articles. The reason why they were used in the Old Testament is they were used to foreshadow what God will do in Christ. The Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So in the revealed scriptures, which we call mystery, 
in the revealed scriptures, the word mystery is mysterion. It means that which requires explanation. So the Old Testament requires explanation. The explanation of the Old Testament is in the New Testament. Everything in the Old Testament was to foreshadow Christ. So since they didn't have the Holy Spirit, they used olive oil symbolically to point to the Holy Spirit. They didn't have Christ, so they used bread as manna. They used water from the rock symbolically to exemplify Christ. When Jesus showed up, he first of all started retiring all the shadows. In John chapter 6, he said to them, I am that living bread that came down from heaven. He said, and while your father ate, they ate and they died. But this is that true bread that a man may eat and not live. Then he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. When you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have life. He's changing the narratives. Stay away from manna, look for me. Stay away from water from the rock, look for me. He said to the woman at the well, he said, the water you drink, you will thirst all the time. But anyone that will drink the water that I shall give, it shall be in him a well springing up to everlasting life. He's talking about eternal life. In the New Testament, there are no shadows. You don't need oil. You don't need water. You don't need mantle. You don't need all that. Thing. It's, all, it's, all, it's all shadows. They have no spiritual relevance. Christ in you is greater than oil, is greater than bottle, is greater than handkerchief, is greater than... Because when you apply the oil, if something clean it, it's gone. In the book of Colossians chapter 2, he says it perishes with the using. But the anointing, the anointing stays now? The Holy Ghost in you mm. stays forever. <laughs> you don't need this oil. In the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, he says you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Verse 27, he now explains. But the anointing you have received of him abideth in you. You have no need for any man to be rubbing you oil. It has no relevance. They are wasting your money, wasting your time, and just rubbishing you. The Holy Ghost in the believer is the totality of God's eternal anointing, resident in a believer. And you don't need any physical symbol applied on you. You know, this is what it is. All those things are like signboards pointing to Christ. All of them pointing to Christ. So if you have signboards, signposts that are pointing to a destination, when you arrive at the destination, do you leave the destination and come and hug the signpost? No. So if oil, water are all pointing to Christ, when you meet Christ, you don't leave Christ and be carrying oil and water around like a native doctor. You stay with Christ. Christ is more than enough. He's more than enough. He's okay. more than enough. Good evening, Mr. Leo. God bless us this night. We are so, so happy. Is it right for a man of God to demand tithes from you because he believes his prayers opened way for you to get a job yes but this is so so uh, come on uh, occurrence be, yes in the maybe book is the materialistic prophet, gospel maybe i prophesy to you is the materialistic gospel mm. there was a man in the bible called simon mogus in in the book of acts he saw peter operating the gifts of the spirit he went and carried a bag of money he started this nonsense this tap blessing this gift to me my anointing opened up for you who did you die did you die on the cross you didn't die on the cross whether you prayed for the person or not, if the person knew enough to pray, it will happen. Jesus said, he that acts it, receive it. He that seek it, find it. He that knock it, the door shall be open. You know, in the kingdom of God, nobody is superior, nobody inferior. We're all children of God. We have the same spirit of God. Now, so Simon Magus brought a bag of money. You know what Peter told him? Your money perish with you because you cannot buy the gift of God. Okay. And I think there are some bold men of God that need to start rebuking some people like that go and perish with your money you cannot buy the gift of god the gift of god is freely given if you were to buy you can't afford it so stay satisfied with what christ has done but if a man of god pray for you ministers to you and you are blessed and out of your heart you really feel like saying thank you there's nothing wrong with that but not a man of god demanding as if you are going to pay school fees mm -mm. that one is totally wrong freely you have received Freely, you give. I know preachers won't like this, but it changes nothing. The truth remains the truth forever and ever. 
Good evening, Mr. Liu. I want to thank you for inviting Dr. Abel at this sweet evangelical program today. We pray the Almighty to bless him endlessly. Uh, we need preachers like him today. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mr. Liu and the man of God in the studio. This is my question still on the topic of materialistic and prosperity in churches today. When some preachers pray for miracle money, how does that operate that Christians in their own camps are pray for. Ngekak is writing from Nguti, um, that is uh, in Nguti subdivision, uh, somewhere after Kumba. Uh, good evening, Mr. Liu. I want to thank you for inviting Dr. Eber. We are blessed. Uh, Tabi is writing from Bonaberry, out here in uh, Douala. This one says, uh, James 5.14, is anyone sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Is this one okay? Ask the man of God. Asimo is writing from Tiku, watching you vividly. Uh, good evening, Mr. Leo. What an excellent teaching uh, this evening. Is it possible this man of God's teachings online? I am Mr. Same in Tombel. Tombel is uh, okay. It is uh, true that uh, some of, most of them are in uh, rural, rural areas. Yeah. Areas, uh, but if you you get to YouTube, uh, yep. if you have the opportunity, go yep. to YouTube. Just type uh, Abel yep. Damina, Damina teaching. You get a thousands. thousands of them. So they are there on YouTube. You can uh, follow them. Uh, but this particular program, it is going to be on my Media Prime right. uh, Facebook uh, page and uh, YouTube page. So. But sir, I'm Itame writing from mile four, Bonadi Kumbo in Limbe. Uh, please, I wish to ask uh, why is it that most men of God will bring out stickers to put maybe in houses, offices, and cars, but the same men of God have but bodyguards again? That's please, right. how can we get uh, the man of God's uh, contact for personal counseling? Um, well, Dr. Ebel, so many persons are going to yeah. want your number. I don't know. Yeah. I, should, I should share. We have a number. We okay. have a number. We'll give you like. They are, on, they are on that card. Okay. So those, those, those who want to get to the man of God, just after the program, request for the number, and I'm going to share the number with you. That's right. Yes, but... Um, Let me deal with those two issues. Yes. James 5.14, is there any sick among you? So the first question is, who was James writing to? You need to find out who was James writing to. He wasn't writing to you today. He was writing to Jewish Christians. Because chapter 1 verse 1 says, To all the Jews, 12 tribes of Israel, scattered abroad. Those are the people he was writing to. So why oil? Among Jewish people, they have a culture of using olive oil, like first aid. First aid. In Israel, if anybody is sick, the first thing you do for him is you rub him olive oil. It's cultural. So James now says, is there any, is there any, like a visitor comes to your church, sick among you? Settle the cultural aspect. Rub him oil. Then he now says, but it is the prayer of faith that we heal, not the oil. The prayer of faith that will heal the sick. And if he has committed sins, the Lord will heal him. But you are not a Jew, so you don't need oil. Oil is a practice, cultural practice, not spiritual. Cultural practice for Jewish people, not for you. That's why we don't use oil. We speak in Jesus' name and sickness flees. God has given him a name that is above every name. He sent his word and his word healed them. If the word of God and the name of Jesus is not enough for you, then you are greedy, my dear. Because that should be more than enough. That name has power. It heals, delivers, and sets free. And God has given you that name. You should be happy and satisfied with that name. There was another question. I can't remember what it was. The person was asking. I'm sure he still has, he still has to talk about uh, tight again. The payment yes. of tithes, yeah. Yes, a and pastor uh, demanding st stickers. stickers. Yes. Well, the reason why they give you stickers is because they know you're very stupid. You're not intelligent. You're not smart. So they give you stickers and collect your money. But they know that those stickers don't carry anything. The stickers, Satan will even carry a sticker and slap you because he has no respect for it. Let me shock you. The devil has a copy of your Bible. He has a copy. And the Bible says he carries it and he trembles. He respects the Bible so well. But he does not believe the Bible. See that? So that you have a sticker or you have a Bible doesn't scare the devil. It is the sword of the spirit in your heart. The word of God in your spirit that carries power. So you don't need those stickers. Except you just want to, you know, patronize and, and just humor that you're a man of God. But you really don't need any sticker. You don't need bangles. The word of God should be in your heart. The word of God should be in your spirit. That's where the power is. 
Now, when you say uh, stop believing in fantasies and imaginations, there is nothing like spirit wife or spirit husband. Spirit cannot uh, marry. They are not mortal. It's only mortal beings that uh, can marry. But we have uh, so many, I don't know whether it's deliverance or casting Issues. out of demons. Yes. We hear these persons also talk here eh, yeah. uh, that I got it to you. Yep. 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 You know, the thing is, ignorance is a big issue, actually. You okay. know, because many people believe because they have dreams and they have sex in the dream. Some have dream and they see themselves pregnant in the dream. Some have dream and they see themselves surrounded with children. They think they are possessed, but they are really not possessed. As a child of God, the moment you got born again, your spirit was born again. But your mind still has old files that needs to be deleted. It's called the renewing of the mind. If those files are not deleted, in your subconscious, you will still be having those dreams, like you're having sex, or like you're having an encounter or pregnant or all that. Let me give you another illustration. A little boy played football in the afternoon. And after playing a lot of football in the afternoon, he now lies down to sleep at night. Then he jumps up. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. And the father or the mother runs after him. Junior, come back. Come back. They grab him and put on the bed. He sleeps. In the morning, they say, why were you playing ball? He says, I don't remember. But did he play ball? Yes. Did he jump? Yes. It was real. But it was in his subconscious. You have sex in the dream and sometimes you even discharge because it is registered in your subconscious. It's not deliverance. You need many of you that have done deliverance. Even after the deliverance, you still have those dreams. What you need is a deleting of the old file. That file is registered. It needs to be deleted. It's like when you got born again, you still know how to drive a car before you were born again because they are memory. Those things are in your memory. So the teaching of God's word begins to delete, begins to renew your mind. That's why Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know, in Matthew chapter 22 was where they confronted Jesus. They said to Jesus, one man married. And then after he married the wife, he died. The wife married his brother. The brother died. Up to the seventh brother. Then they now said to Jesus, on the resurrection day, whose wife will she be? Because all the seven brothers married her. Then Jesus said to them, are you also without understanding? He said, do you not know? That in the resurrection there is no marriage. They shall be like the angels. So angels cannot marry. Which means angels cannot have sex. Because angels are spirits. So evil spirits cannot have sex. They cannot marry. Because spirits cannot have sex. If you are having sex in the dream. Or you are having such encounters in the dream. It is coming from your subconscious. So what you need is a renewing of your mind. By the teaching of God's word. By the washing of water by the word. And that's why it says, be not conformed, but be transformed. That change you're looking for will come by the renewing of your mind. Which is a function of sound Bible teaching. Hope that helps. Good evening, Mr. Leo and Calvary. Uh, greetings to the man of God. Well, I just want to ask uh, or to know if it is uh, true or possible that some people don't have the Holy Spirit in them. Actually, I want to know about the Holy Spirit and how it operates in human beings. Uh, secondly, I also want to know if speaking in tongues means you have the Holy Spirit. And what about those who don't speak in tongues? Uh, Prince Bile is uh, watching from Budapest uh, in Hungary. Wow. Well, Receiving the Holy Spirit is salvation. That's why he says, he that is born of flesh is flesh. He that is born of the Spirit is spirit. The moment you received Christ, the Holy Spirit came in. Every child of God has the Holy Spirit. You don't look for the Holy Spirit after salvation. God gives you the Spirit once, and that is at the point of salvation. Whether you speak in tongues or not, once you are born again, you have the Holy Spirit. But if you don't speak in tongues, you cheat yourself. Because speaking in tongues is the doorway to the supernatural. He says, this sign shall follow those that believe. In my name, they shall speak with new tongues. Is the doorway to the supernatural. But it has to be taught well. You know, a lot of Pentecostals have not handled the subject of tongues theologically and biblically well. That's why there's a lot of abuse. So there's the need for proper teaching. And I have a teaching on it. Tongues, interpretation of tongues is about part one to four or so and it's on online on youtube if you go there you can find more you can listen and it will help you a lot so that you enjoy your relationship with god you get rid of fear and be confident and enjoy the presence of the holy spirit that lives on your inside i hope that helps good evening mr Liu, and to our able dr eber damina i would like uh, to have his uh, number to be part of his program uh, tomorrow 
The Program uh, Leadership Conference is holding tomorrow at um, the venue is New Revelation of Christ Ministries, Foku Bonaberry in Douala at, I don't know, 10 a.m.? 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. 4 p.m. So yes. if you are in Douala, please uh, take the rendezvous. Those of you requesting for the numbers, can you just write to me after the program? I will share the number with you. And... Um, you can get to me mm. or you get I'll, I'll get you connected to mm. uh, the organizers of the program so that you can fellowship and also get uh, live what uh, Dr. Abel is uh, sharing with us uh, this evening. Uh, but you also see that God does not choose a wife or a husband for anybody. You find your spouse, but you have uh, to do that wisely. Mm -hmm. So many men of God are, are getting divorced today. Mm. Or is it also because yeah. they were not yeah. led by the Spirit? And no, not because they were not led by the Spirit. Mm. Some of them were ignorant of what marriage is. Okay. And that's why they teach it like that. Mm. There's nothing like one rib. You don't have one rib. <laughs> because if it's only one rib, the day one man mistakenly picks another person's rib, everybody will pick the wrong rib. So there's nothing like that. There's nothing like one will of God for you. That's why when people die, you still marry somebody else. So what about marriage? Bible says, he that finds a wife, finds a good. So man must find. But he gives you certain parameters. First of all, be not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So if you're a child of God, don't even go out. Don't even talk to an unbeliever for marriage. Number two, make no friendship with an angry man. So even if a man is born again, but he's full of anger, or a woman is full of anger, Bible says, stay away from the person. Bible says, make no friendship with a drunkard. If somebody likes drinking alcohol too much, don't make the person your friend. Talk more of marrying the person. There are such indices in the Bible. I have a teaching on, on that whole thing. It's called wisdom for living. Wisdom for living is online there. But in marriage, you make the choice. How well your marriage will be will be determined on how educated you were about making your choice. Number one. Then number two, when two of you get married, you must be ready to make adjustments. It takes two people to make marriage work. Once there is no adjustment in marriage, crisis, misunderstandings are bound to out. You, they are bound to be there. But the reason why there are a lot of divorces today is because of many factors: economic factors, impatience, you know, um, lack of allowing the word of God fill the heart of a believer, so it allows for unforgiveness, bitterness. It allows for domestic abuse. All those things are the things that are giving rise to a lot of divorces in the body of Christ today. I have a, teach, a teaching on it, a book, Understanding Marriage, Relationship, and Family Lives. It, it deals with divorce, remarriage, doctrinally, from the Word of God. It's a book. I'm sure we'll have it at the conference. If you come there, you can get a copy of that book, you know, tomorrow. Okay. Um, some persons would want to you to highlight on uh, what uh, you have preached. I've, I also have had the opportunity to listen to it about uh, whether women should wear trousers or not. Well, the wearing of trousers is culture. Okay. It's not Bible. <laughs> it's they culture. Could they, should every woman cover their hair in church? Yeah, it, if you read that scripture in Corinthians where Paul talked about covering of head. Mm -hmm. First of all, all these things are in the book of Corinthians because the, book of, the church in Corinth was a church of plenty of problems. Okay. So when he says a woman should cover her head, first of all, if you read the pretext, see in Bible teaching and Bible study, don't just pick a verse and run. A verse, once you remove it from its immediate environment, is dead. The life of a verse is within its envirom environment. We have what we call pretext, post-text, to understand context. So when you read a verse, read the verses before and the verses after to understand what they are talking about. So first of all, he first said, the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. He's dealing with headship. So the head of Christ, God. The head of the man, Christ. The head of the woman, the husband. Then he now says, any woman praying without covering her head, her husband, she's living in rebellion, she's loud, she's disobedient to her husband, and she's praying, he says it's a shame to her. He says a woman should not prophesy in church when she has just fought with her husband, abuse him. Because he's dealing with hair, death, not hair. Covering of hair, death. husband, not hair. Go and read it. You will see that's what he's talking about. And wearing of trousers is culture. When he says you shall not wear what belongs to a woman and what belongs to a man, he didn't tell us what belongs to a man and what belongs to a woman. Moreover, the people that were given that instruction were Israelites on their way to Canaan. Because in Canaan, there were a lot of homosexuals. So Moses told them, when you go there, don't dress like a woman. 
and don't dress like a man. So you can be different from the homosexuals. He was not talking about dressing code. He was talking about his consecration away from the homosexuals in Canaan. But if you want to talk about wearing trousers, what did Jesus wear when he was on earth? He wore a gown and a band on his waist like a woman. Because dressing is culture. It depends on what your society accepts as the mode of dressing. In the Old Testament, the priests wore gown and tied their waist with a band like women in the Old Testament. Yeah, that's how they dressed. You know, and today there are societies you go to, a man wears a skirt and a shirt. They are like Scotland. There are places where you go to, their culture is you wear cap. Places like Puerto Rico. If I go there as a preacher, I wear my cap and preach because my cap doesn't stop the presence of God. Okay, let's even go down to the roots. You are naked in the bathroom as a woman and you are batting and you pray. God answers. You are naked in the bathroom as a man. You pray and God answers. So God is not bothered about what you wear, what you don't wear. The reason why we dress is so that we can make each other comfortable. We cover our nakedness. So dressing has to be with an intent to cover your nakedness. Whether you wear or you don't wear, it doesn't stop God from answering your prayer and it doesn't make God uncomfortable and it's not a sin whether you wear something or not. However, as a decent child of God, you dress to cover your nakedness and appear honorable so you can get respect in the society where you live. I hope that helps. Okay. Um, please, sir, ask the man of God if they teach people on how to speak in tongues. Okay. Um, I don't know. We are going to come no, to that. No, you don't teach people how to speak in tongues. Okay. You don't teach people. But you teach people how to receive the Holy Spirit, not how to speak in tongues. And that how to receive the Holy Spirit is the gift of utterance, making them know that the Holy Spirit is in them. And as they begin to pray and listen, utterance will come up and they will speak what the Spirit gives them. Okay. But you don't tell them, say, la, la, la. No, no, no. You, you, it's done by the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was come, they all spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So utterance is given by the Spirit. This man of God, is it uh, ideal for a man of God to curse people out of anger or pray evil to people? Like in a house where there is a theft, he prays for death of anyone that steals or accidents as he moves about using uh, things like salt, okay? Uh, good evening, bro, please, even for the man of God's uh, phone number also, brother, I'm writing from Kumba. Eli, please, can you just put, uh, the, I've just sent a number to you, can you put it on air so that people can get the number and get to them directly? So many persons are uh, requesting for numbers. Yes. Yeah. So I can also read, I have one here, 677 okay. I repeat, 677 Seven nine again six seven seven two two one eight seven nine and we have many campuses like in Bamenda six seven zero two nine three seven one zero six seven zero two nine three seven one zero Ibonji campus Ibonji campus six seven nine nine eight nine nine one three Ibonji campus six seven nine nine eight nine nine one three in yawunde the number to call is six nine five one one nine two five two in yawunde six nine five one one nine two five two and if you need any information at all six seven seven two two one eight seven nine those numbers should suffice for whatever else you want to find out from me Oops, difficult to even read a message. They are running in there. Yes. Uh, good evening, Papa. I'm Alexander uh, Luquesa, writing from Zambia. I watched a teaching that you did uh, years back, and you asked the church to see uh, when Jesus rose from the dead. He ate a uh, fish. Was the fish uh, digested? If yes, uh, did he go to the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> Papa, I need to learn about uh, that. But there are so, so, so many uh, questions. Uh, good evening, Mr. Liu. I really like the program of today. And the man of God is speaking more of the truth. And I love his message. It's uh, Mick Chana writing from uh, Tiko. Uh, greetings, uh, Mr. Liu. Let Dr. Abel Tamina uh, explain why angels slept with uh, daughters of uh, men and they gave birth to giants in genesis uh, 6 so uh note that you say angels don't uh, marry can they explain uh truth and senior writing from limbe angels didn't sleep with women 
at all. In that Genesis, it needs to be explained to you. I have a, a, a full teaching on it with scriptural exegesis. If you email our office or reach out to us, we will make sure you get the materials. But angels didn't, never slept, even in that Genesis. It was the giants that slept with the daughters and produced giants. It wasn't angels. It's the way it was written. There was a syntax situation. I need to explain that to you. You know, so if you get that teaching, it will help you. Because it has to be exegesis. Okay. Is it true that the Bible was uh, thwarted by uh, the Romans who collected uh, the books? Uh, please ask Dr. Uh, Demon. Oh. Well, the Bible, the Bible was canonized. Canonizing means a yardstick was used in measuring which, is, which books should be in the Bible and which ones should not be. There's a test of canonizing, you know, by the early church fathers. And when they looked at it, they discovered that there's only one thread that ties the books that can be canonized as Holy Scripture. And that thread is the message of Christ. And in all the 66 books, the central message of each book is Christ. So across the thread of the Holy Writ is one message. That message ties the Bible together. That's what makes it infallible. That's what makes it authoritative. And that's what makes it the, 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 the word of God. Because it, it has a consistency of communication. One message written by over 1,500 authors across many years. And when the books were collated, they were saying the same thing. Okay. That's why it's true. Um, oops. Good evening, Mr. Liu. Please, can Dr. Damina explain to us uh, what the Bible says about women preaching in church? The Bible says, as in all the churches of the saints, let the women remain quiet. Basil is writing from Lima. Well, that women keep quiet is in church in Corinth because the women in Corinth historically were lousy women. Where the okay. preacher is preaching, they start making noise. <laughs> so Paul saying, this particular church is in Corinth. Shut up. But remember, the same Holy Spirit in a man is in a woman. I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. The first people that preached the gospel after resurrection were women. So women were the apostles to the apostles of Christ. It was women that preached to them Peter that Jesus has risen. That already tells you God's mind about women preaching. And I believe in these last days, women are going to preach Christ like never before. It's going to be heavy because the move of God in these last days is going to be no male, no female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Let's talk a little bit uh, more about uh, prophecies. Prophecies. Yes. The reigning, the reigning uh, churches today is uh, those, uh, those churches that are led by prophets. Almost everybody wants to know how their tomorrow and... Um, Yes, next year is going to uh, look like, and almost everybody is patronizing it. Is this a fulfillment of uh, scripture? It's actually, it's actually a dangerous trend, very okay. dangerous, because the prophecy of a prophet cannot replace the infallibility of God's word. So any church where prophecy of the prophet is celebrated more than the word of God is a red flag. Run away for your life. Because what is authentic is the teaching of the word of God. Prophecy is not supposed to be every day and it's not supposed to be all the time because it cannot replace the teaching of the Lord. That's why Peter will say we have a more sure word of prophecy. Second Peter 1 19, 20, 21, 22. We have a more sure word. And he say you do well that you take heed to that word as a light that shines and the day star arises in your hearts. So the true test of knowing whether this church is a good church for me to attend, number one is that there is enough time to teach you the word of God. Not just teach you the word of God, but rightly divide it for you to understand who God is in the scriptures. Not prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. The problem is because native doctors are no more in the bush and people like patronizing native doctors. So a lot of people who are native doctors have rebranded. So you go to them for candle, you go to them for oil, because that's what native doctors do. You go to them to be collecting prayer. But a church is not supposed to be a prayer collection place. It's supposed to be a place of teaching you to pray, not to collect prayer. You too should know how to pray. God wants all of us to grow and mature and reach the world with the gospel. Not to become victims that go around collecting prayer, candles, pepper, granite, papa, apple here and there as if you're a collection house. You're supposed to be taught, equipped. He says he gave the gifts of the spirit for the equipping of the saints. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. To do the work of ministry. That is what God's will is for his church. Uh, doctor, we, we talked about uh, tithing, but I want to quote you again. You see, a man that follows Christ...
cannot make tithing more important than the sacrifice of Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. But and you see that okay, tithing was um, Old, Old Testament. Yes. But many persons are hanging on the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter three. Who was he writing to? He was writing to the priests that were collecting tithe, but they were not paying tithe. Malachi three is not even talking to the Israelite. He's talking to the priest in Israel because they used to collect tithe and they are supposed to pay tithe of tithe. So those priests were not paying tithe of tithe. So Malachi said they are cursed because they are not paying tithe of tithe. But remember, under the law, there are curses and blessings. But Christ has redeemed us from all that cause. So in the New Testament, no more curses, only blessings. And the blessings is because of what Christ has done. So we don't pay. We give. We support the work of God. We give for the cause of Christ. That's what we do in the New Testament. You mean that um, no our, 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 our wealth and everything is not going to be devoured? The devourer is not coming because... In fact, many people around the world who follow my teaching said, when I stop tithing, now I see plenty money. Now I have more money. Now I enjoy. That is a mindset. The reason why you stop tithing and things break down is because as a man thinketh so easy. They have wired your mind to think like that. But when your mind is liberated and you begin to see the true character of God, you begin to see the love of God. You begin to see the nature of God. Your relationship with God now is no more transactionary. It's a father and a son. When you give, you're not giving to bribe God. You're not giving to manipulate God. You're giving because you're a responsible child who wants to support the work of his father on the earth. I hope that's clear. Yes, but you say that the mission of the gospel is to bring a man to a destination called salvation. Yep. The persons who are actually very worried that um, the goal of most Christians is not a salvation, but to inherit this earth. Because of the materialistic gospel. The materialistic gospel actually measures that it is how much you have money that shows how much God is with you. That's fraudulent. Brother Paul says there are some people who preach that gain is godliness. In First Timothy chapter 6, and he says from such people, stay away. Then he now said, it is not gain, it's godliness. It is godliness with contentment that is great gain. He said, for it is certain we brought nothing into the world. And it is certain we will take nothing out of the world. Therefore, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. So the materialistic gospel is what takes people's eyes from what Christ has done, from salvation in Christ, to looking for material things. And that's why there are a lot of false converts. A lot of false brethren in our churches. They are not really born again. But they just have a form. Because of the kind of message they are being fed with. Okay. Because of the kind of message uh, they are being uh, fed with. Many persons actually would uh, not uh, understand uh, where we are coming from. In trying to understand uh, the, the flow from Old to the New Testament. Because we, are, we have the tendency of always running back to the Old Testament to justify some of the actions that we are carrying out here. Uh, is there not... Um, a yardstick? No, no. Is there not uh, some sort of um, uh, ignorance or a yearning for a better understanding of uh, the gospel of grace? Oh, there is a big yearning. Mm -hmm. And that is why I will recommend for you my teachings here on YouTube. The Old and the New Covenant in Christ. It's about 32 hours. The old and the new. Because you must first of all, that's where it all begins from. You must know what is Old Testament, what is New Testament. Because there is Old Testament in New Testament, and there is New Testament in Old Testament. So you must be able to know what is New Testament, what is Old Testament. So when you take the Bible, or when a preacher is talking, you know whether this man is preaching Old Testament or New Testament. And remember Jesus said, you cannot pour new wine into old wine skin. Otherwise, the skin will burst. You can't be practicing Old and New Testament. We are able ministers of the New Testament, not of the later. For the later kill it, but the Spirit give it life. Old Testament is what man can do to please God. New Testament is what Christ has done that has pleased God that you partake of. Those are the two dividing lines. There is life before the cross and life after the cross. Life after the cross is New Testament. Life before the cross is Old Testament. If the way people live before the cross is still the way you're living after the cross, then the cross is useless. The cross of Jesus changes everything. So that's why you must understand the difference. The way we live after the cross is not the way they lived before the cross. Because the cross changed 
everything. I have a book like that, Life Before the Cross, Life After the Cross, and we have it at the conference. You can get a copy and begin to read and free yourself from being messed up by ignorance and religious dogmas. Please, uh, man of God, can you throw some light on this issue on miracle money that every man of God wants to perform today? First of all, there's nothing like miracle money. It says calm. There's nothing like it. There's no verse of the scripture that says there's miracle money. It's not even in the Bible. There's nothing like it. So, Brother Paul said, he that does not walk should not eat. If you don't walk, you, you should not eat. There's nothing like miracle money. I believe in miracles. That God can give you miracles. What kind of miracles? Healing of your body. Restoration of your body. God can give you favor with people. God can give you ideas, concepts, insights. But you still have to walk. You still have to do something. You still have to get involved in commerce, industry. That's what is crippling Africa. Because the, the Christianity is big. And Christians are taught to just be docile and wait for manna from above. No, we have to be creative. We have to be innovative. The richest people in the world today are not Christians. Isn't that shocking? They are not people who pay tight. The richest people on earth today have never paid tight. They don't even believe in the existence of God. That should instruct you. That this world has been created by God for man, so man can engage his mental faculty, engage enterprise, engage you know creativity and innovation, and turn what God has created into products that can bring money. Elon Musk is one of the richest men on earth today. But if you look around, you see his products, you see his satellites, you see his cars, you see his companies, he's providing services. People are paying, that's why he's rich. So a child of God ought to get involved in industry. I used to tell Christians, the books we read in school, our commerce books were not written from the Bible. Economics was not written from the Bible. Business administration, they are not materials from the Bible. Why? Because there are rules that govern making money in this world. And therefore, that's why you went to school to go and study so you can engage and make money for the services you provide society. There's nothing like miracle money. But God can give you a miracle of favor where somebody who has, it, has made money can support you. Where somebody who has made money by working can give to you. And that's what we saw in the ministry of Jesus. And the only verse, the only verse these miracle pe money peddlers are using is that verse where the Bible says, Jesus said, go by the sea, you will find a fish, open the mouth of the fish, there is money in the mouth, pay tax. But you have not looked at the historical analysis because that scripture was written by an eyewitness. Eyewitness account. Somebody could have dropped the money by the river. Somebody could have dumped the money and the fish swallowed it. And then when they opened the mouth, they found it there. But it's not even a miracle money because every country, the central bank of that country, is the only legal entity that is permitted to produce legal tender. God is not a criminal. He cannot be dropping money from the sky. God cannot do that. That's criminal. See, if God was a criminal, Jesus would not be born through the womb of a baby. He would have fallen from the sky and said, come on to me. So that everybody would see that it's spectacular. But why did God come through the legal way of being born? Entered the womb of a woman, stayed for nine months, they delivered him as a baby. He grew and grew and grew to become a man. Because God does not break laws. He's not a lawbreaker. So if, if Cameroon has a central bank that produces CDs, then if God wants to, I mean, uh, Cephas, if God wants to bless you, he will use somebody that has already made Cephas from Central Bank Cameroon to give to you as an investment or as favor. But not that money is falling from the sky. Those men of God that say that, why is it that after they preach it, they now ask you to give them? Why don't they close the church doors and command the money to fall from the sky? It's fraudulent. And don't be scammed. And that's why you must have knowledge. Okay, um, I want to go. I don't know. Um, this one says, um, I am the one we're saying. Eh? The, the, the Bible is the Bible that says, The time shall come when people cannot endure sound of train. One of your quotes Are we now living the times? Because, yes, most of what you are saying it does not actually make sense to people who have for so many years been moving along different lines. Is this just the fulfillment of? Uh, what yeah, it is. It's a fulfillment. First Timothy, I mean, Second Timothy, chapter four. Mm. It says, "For the time shall come, verse three, when they shall not endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is not sweet. That's why you endure it. Mm. You endure because it's going. To, it's a lot of teaching. It's going to go against your mindset. That's why in teaching we cast down imaginations. You have to unlearn so you can relearn. Because sometimes the things you learned before they were not right. They were people's ideas, people's thoughts into the Bible." So you have to unlearn to relearn. You have to approach the word of God 
with the attitude of a baby and then revelation knowledge will hit you and you suddenly see what you didn't see before in the pages of the holy scriptures it's, it's very true dr Ebe, your church in cameroon you said you call them campuses campuses why do you call them campuses we want we want to erase the church mentality okay we want people to come to campuses with an idea of i'm going to learn because a lot of teaching will be required to correct a lot of things in the body of christ so we can see a genuine move of god that will last okay um we hope that uh, the message has gone through if you really want to learn from what uh, the man of god just said i hear this evening write me or you get the number that is on your screen you can get to them and uh, you enroll in one of the campuses yep. and yep. get yep. the undiluted the diluted uh, word of god uh, for the salvation of uh, mankind we need um, so much to change yeah and uh, but now we are talking about miracle money yep which according to you makes christians and africans to be lazy yeah how about the way church activities are organized in africa where you have in a week persons are expected to be in church for three four days in a year maybe you may if you if you have to accumulate um, all, all of the services and programs that are organized it may require at least four months of staying in church in a year four months in church yet we need to develop yet we need to be productive is that uh, what church is? services should not tamper with productivity and development okay people should go to work every day go to work monday to friday if possible saturday go to work make money church services should be such that we look for convenient times when people are through with work, through with everything. Mm. Then we can meet. It's, it's a good thing to meet as many times as possible. Mm. In the early church, they met every day. It's a good thing. But it must not conflict with productive hours mm. in businesses and jobs and career. We can meet in the evenings. We can meet at night. One hour, two hours, study, pray together. It's a good thing. But it must not be at productive times when people ought to be in their works and offices working hard to meet the needs of society and to cater for their families okay um good evening sir i just wanted to ask uh, which scripture says consume the green leaves a back of tree for it was meant for man's healing please let the man of god educate us on this uh, because it has been a long time uh, debate john is writing from uh, limbe uh, good evening uh, birth of jesus a miracle or real if yes how possible John is writing from Nob, okay, in Gokutunja. Uh, I'm blessed so much. Uh, please ask the man of God to enlighten us on the gospel of when uh, safe, you are safe forever. Mitiran is writing from uh, Kumba. Good evening, Pastor. I'm talking from Bingo. Is it good uh, for a child of God to make up? Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, so I wish to ask uh, where doctor is training his pastors. Uh, Divine is writing from Muya. Good evening to you, uh, Divine. Good evening, Mr. Liu. Please ask Dr. Abel uh, the relevance of Holy Communion. Is it necessary, necessary to receive Holy Communion? Always. Prince David is writing uh, from Tico. Uh, please, Mr. Liu, please, I want to ask Dr. Abel to explain to us where God lives because he said in one of his teachings that God does not live in heaven. Yes, I'm sure I've listened to that message uh, too. Uh, this one says uh, christ said seek ye first the kingdom of god how do we find this kingdom what's the most practical way to seek it i'm writing from Bafusam. good evening mr leo please ask the man of god uh, that eternal life is here on earth or in heaven okay good evening uh, sir what about acts 19 12 that says handkerchief were taken from the body of paul and was used to heal the sick and the woman with the issue of blood uh, didn't he touch uh, but the garment and not the body of jesus which means that uh, the garment of jesus was anointed so how do you say the anointing can't uh, be transferred uh, to objects good evening mr leo i heard that reverend uh, saying the bible says do do not uh, be equally yoked with unbelievers i want to ask the reverend if you don't go closer to them as a believer how then do you convert them to become like you i am hannah writing from uh, kumba good evening mr liu as the man of god uh, if prophecy can be taught mercy is writing from bonaberry so many too many questions yes from almost <laughs> i can imagine. every community yes you know to help you you know i will encourage go on youtube just start typing my name on youtube 
the videos are there. <laughs> First of all, for losing salvation, I have a soteria, 35 hours. Can a believer lose salvation? It's 35 hours of teaching. For the person asking for um, Holy Communion, I have a book, The Communion Table. You can get it tomorrow at the conference. The Communion Table is about 350 pages explaining. First of all, to even shock you, there's nothing like Holy Communion in the Bible. You can't find it anywhere in the Bible. It doesn't exist. What they call Holy Communion is actually Passover rebranded. But get that book. It will help you a lot. And you'll understand the import of the bread and the blood that was used as Holy Communion in the Old Testament. What it means today for the believer in Christ Jesus. Yes, you but know, somebody talked about uh, the handkerchief. that was Handkerchief seen. brought out of and Paul's body. Yes. It wasn't Paul that was giving them the handkerchief. It was a situation of unbelievers came and they saw the power of God on Paul and somebody took cloth and touched Paul and went and gave to the sick. It wasn't Paul who carried that practice. Moreover, in the Bible, one practice doesn't make it a doctrine. It must have two or three witnesses and there are no such. The woman that taught Jesus cloth, she wasn't, it wasn't Jesus that said, touch my cloth. That was her level of faith and she was an unbeliever. And in God's goodness, he reached out to her. But there's no apostolic teachings because the New Testament church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What the apostles never did and never practiced, were not permitted to practice it because Christianity is apostolic. Christianity is historic. There's a foundation laid. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid. Christ Jesus. So the use of elements, the use of articles is not apostolic. It's not New Testament. And even the cases you cite in the Bible, they are just one, one, one instances that were done by people who didn't know Christ. It wasn't done by the apostles. So it's not a practice of the New Testament. And even though you say the anointing resides on clothes, even you yourself, if you are born again, the anointing resides in your clothes. So why do you want to collect another person's cloth and use? I mean, Christ in you is more important than anything. And you should focus on that. That will help you from being misled and being taken advantage of. Good evening. Emmanuel is writing from Ebolova. Please, I wish to know if every Christian must speak in tongue as a sign of the Holy Spirit. Uh, please, can the man of God uh, throw more light on sowing of seeds? Uh, Emmanuel from the South uh, region. Um, Emmanuel, uh, the man of God spoke about that already. Yeah, we don't sow seed, we give. You know, we okay. give for the work of God. We support the work of God. Remove that seed so we mentality. Because once you start seeing seed, it means you want to give and it will grow and come back as harvest. We no. got almost all the time when crusades are organized here, yeah, people are called out. One million stand here, 500,000. Is the materialistic gospel? That's a problem. But doesn't it, does it not work? Does it work? I don't know. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. God's goodness cannot be purchased. Mm -hmm. The moment you say it works, it means God is mercenary. Okay. You have to tap it. Mm -mm. God is a father of all. He's good to all. Those preachers are just taking advantage of people. There's nothing wrong in a preacher saying support the work of God. Support what I do. Give to support. There's nothing wrong in that. But don't tie it to a blessing like Psalm 91 for 91 blessings. It's like going to a shop to say, I want coca oats. 5,000 CDs or, or 5,000 sephas is exchange. God is not in a transaction. He's a father. You don't pay your father to provide for you now. If we that are evil don't pay our parents to give us things. Is it our father God that we're going to be paying to get things done? Those preachers have understood that people are gullible. People are not educated. People are not spending time with their Bible. So they just pull those things on them, collect their money and go. And most times, even the people that give will tell you that, you know, I give, I'm still waiting for the, for the miracle. I'm still waiting. They keep waiting and waiting and waiting. Because it doesn't work like that. Okay, okay. And sometimes if they have one testimony or two, they highlight it and make it big to make it look like the thing is working. Whether you give or not, God's blessings are available to all who call upon him out of a good heart. Okay, so um, you are still here in uh, Cameroon? I'm in Cameroon tomorrow, right here in Douala. Nine, I mean, 10 a.m. tomorrow at the Jesus Revelation, at the Now Revelation Ministry. New Revelation. New Revelation Ministry. Ministry. Foku Bonaberry. Okay, it's on the screen. Yep. So, I'll be there at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. tomorrow. Beat me there. Beat me there. Don't wait to be told. We're having explosive times. This evening, the service was brutal before we got here. So much is happening. Men of God, believers, Christians that are tired of being messed around with ignorance. Beat me there tomorrow. 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. tomorrow. Okay. The numbers are also on the screen. You can take and get to them. Or you write and uh, requesting the numbers are from me. I will share 
uh, with you, we want to thank you, um, uh, Doctor, very, very much for honoring our invitation. Thank you, evening. Mr. Leonard, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. It's been a wonderful time. Thank you, you know, viewers around the world for being a part of this. Much more, much more for you in Christ. We want to thank you all who took time off to watch this uh, special edition of uh, Prime R on my Media Prime R TV. Thank you to the production team. Stay blessed. Amen.